Hi, this is Seth Mosley of Full Circle Music. As a Grammy Award winning Christian artist, songwriter, and producer, I'm excited to be a part of a powerful event with personal development legends Brian Tracy, Darren Hardy, and Tom Ziegler. Come join me for this powerful event. Go to BrianTracyMeetsFullCircle.com to learn more. This is an event that will help you grow both personally and professionally. Would love to meet you there. Details are at BrianTracyMeetsFullCircle.com. Here in the studio today, Full Circle Music Show. This is Seth Mosley, and we've got a guest. You've heard her name on the show, perhaps if you've listened all the way to the end of the episodes, like a good listener. Um, this is Kaylee Ingram. She's actually been helping this whole semester with editing these podcasts. So she's been immensely helpful. She's just finishing an internship literally with us today, finishing college up, goes to Belmont University. This is Kaylee Ingram. Hey. Yeah, it's really sad this is my last day with you guys, but thank you for letting me be here and learn so much. Well, first of all, that that's a great question that just came to mind because I, I think it's one that we don't ask often enough. How has it been interning with us? Honestly, I didn't expect to be able to jump right into, I mean, even my first day editing um, in Pro Tools, I didn't expect to just do that on the first day. I thought I would be, you know, just helping clean up or organize things. And you kind of just let me jump in and learn kind of hands on the things that you do right away. So that was really unexpected, but it's been that way the whole time, just unexpected things that I've gotten to do, like going with you to sessions. And I've just learned so much just getting to watch. So, um, and I know not all internships are like that. So I really appreciate just getting to do so much stuff basically. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Jericho's sitting here probably laughing because he's like, well, you're lucky. All the other interns have to go take Seth's car to the dump <laughs> and tear down boxes and <laughs> clean up trash and that well, I guess kind of I stuff. am really lucky then. <laughs> we talked about this on an earlier episode with Steve Ford about what makes a good intern. And he said one out of every you know 10 or 15 comes in and actually cares about learning. They care about contributing. And they care about being there. And it's not, what can I get out of this? It's not, I'm just here for college credit. And it's not just, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'll do your task, and then I'll play on Facebook the rest of the day. And what, I, what we honestly noticed about Kaylee right away was that she's here to learn. She's here to serve. So those are the type of people that are going to get the quote-unquote good jobs. That's what we talked to X about that on the show when he was interning at Soundstage. Um, he was the guy that they hired because he was the guy who was showing up and raising his hand and saying, here, I'm here to serve, whatever that means. And so, honestly, you've been amazing in that regard. So. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's just encouraging. It makes me want to keep being motivated. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's not something you can just teach. It's something that you have. So um, let me ask you, so you, you go to Belmont University. Mm-hmm. How how did you how did you hear about Belmont? How did you get into the music business program? What was that whole story? I heard about Belmont um, actually a friend's dad while we were stationed in Germany. Um, he was looking at the school for his kids, and he didn't really know what it was known for. But when he got here and he realized it was music business, he told me, "Hey, you need to go here, not my kids." I was about fifteen. I found out. A couple years later, as I was searching for colleges, that it's one of five in the whole country that offer a songwriting program. And being a military brat who didn't get to ever connect with another songwriter because we just moved so much and never found a music community like that, um, I decided early on that's what I wanted to study if I was going to go to school at all. So I applied. I knew it was super competitive. Didn't think I would get in. Um, I was actually ready to go to Liberty University because they also have a songwriting program. It's more just worship songs. It's not really as broad, but it's still a great school. So I got accepted, and then God provided the means for me to go. So I just saw all these doors opening that I could not have opened myself. So that's what brought me here and um, trying to finish up strong and use the tools that have been sharpened at the school to use it in the music industry. Well, I love it. We we kind of try to hit on every angle on the show, and we've talked about you know from the other other side of things where well, should you go to college? Should you not go to college? Does it help you? Does it hurt you? And I'd love to hear your take on that. You know, you, you're you're diving into this this career in the music industry. 
And, you know, a lot of people would, would kind of argue that, you know, you don't need, you don't need a, a college degree. I don't personally have a college degree for music, but what's been your experience? Has that, has that been really helpful? Do you feel like you've learned a ton? I feel like I have, honestly. I, I knew a lot of music um, theory, and I've always played, you know, piano and guitar for several years. My mom has taught me since I was three or four. So as far as music in general goes, it hasn't helped me a lot. But the music business, I had no clue about how it worked. So when I got here, and I remember taking um, Mark Maxwell's survey of music business class, and he basically went over the roles of everybody, you know, A&R, publishing, what the label does, how royalties work. And I had no clue that so many people were behind one artist. And so I think for someone who didn't grow up in an environment where you can like plug into a community of music industry people and play out shows and learn how things work, maybe someone like that doesn't need Belmont. But for someone like me, it's a really good introductory ground and then when I got into my internship with Centricity and with you, I had a basic understanding so that I could learn further. Because if I didn't have that, I feel like I'd just be kind of stumped and not know what I was doing, which half the time I don't, but I still try. So, <laughs> Sure. Well, I, I want to flip this interview on its head a little bit. And I'm actually going to introduce a new type of full circle music show. And it's something we're going to start doing called Ask Me Anything. And... Kaylee's getting put on the spot here today. She literally did not know about this an hour ago. And you're actually going to interview me today. How does that sound? Sounds pretty pretty amazing. So and I'm ready called, for it. <laughs> it's called Ask Me Anything. So, you know, I use anything loosely, but you can ask me anything. <laughs> I'm, an, <laughs> I'm an open book. So, But before that, I'm going to put you on the spot times two. Because I think there's a lot of people out there who are in college or wondering, okay, this whole internship thing. Would you make up like a 10, 10 things I learned from interning with a Grammy winning producer? Like you don't have to make it up right now, but like yeah, after this. I would totally do that. I think the very first thing off the top of my head is that you, like you talk about a lot, you are serving the artist and you're serving the song. And I think serving the song was like a phrase in itself I'd never heard before. And it's helped me even in my own songwriting and producing not to be so self-centered that I would think, oh, I like this idea because I came up with it. If someone else's idea is better, it's better. <laughs> so um, I think serving the song, serving the musicians and the artists, that was like the number one thing. But That's yeah, awesome. I'll, I'll have to think about the other nine. <laughs> yeah, so so here's the deal. You can email Kaylee at fullcirclemusic.org. That's C-A-Y-L-E-A at fullcirclemusic.org. And you will get a copy of her guide that she's going to make. I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> the 10 things I learned from interning with a Grammy-winning production team. Does that okay. sound okay? Yeah, it sounds really cool. Okay, so let's flip this thing on its head and let's uh, let's dive into Ask Me Anything. So it's your show. Okay, well, the first thing, like I was just talking about, was the serving attitude um, that I noticed when I got here. So that kind of just wanted me, that made me want to know more about Full Circle's company culture, um, you hear about like bigger corporate companies and how it can be more, I guess, cold and not as relationship based, but you seem to be very relationship based. So why did you choose to be that way and how does that operate in your company? Well, I think our, our core belief is that the highest calling in life is to be a servant. It sounds a little bit paradoxical that, you know, it's not necessarily to achieve the most number ones or to have 20 Grammys, but it's literally to be a servant. And that actually, for me, is a biblical thing. It says that somewhere in the Bible. I should know better where it is, but it's somewhere. It says the highest calling in life is to be a servant of God. And to be a servant of God, you got to be a servant of people. So that's really what it comes from. And honestly, the relational side of that is everything. It's When I first moved to Nashville, I was literally doing everything on every project that I produced. I was, you know a part of the co-writing process and I was playing instrumentation on records. I was programming, I was editing, I was mixing, I was tuning vocals, I was cutting the vocals. Uh, I was, you know, even doing things like, you know, helping with liner notes. I mean, it was, it was literally like I was wearing about every hat. So the one good thing about that is that I learned it all kind of inside out, but the other part that I learned about that is is that I don't enjoy doing production and doing records that way. 
when I first started working and collaborating with other people in the production process, even just like hiring an engineer, hiring mix guys or hiring players and studios, it was just like a whole new world. Cause like, Oh, so this record is not just limited by the amount of creativity that I have on any given day. It's literally limited by nothing because Nashville where we live is a infinite supply of creativity and the talent level here just to reiterate what reed said earlier on is just unreal the players here are stupid good the studios here are amazing it's literally world class so for me it's just a lot more fun way of doing things yeah. and honestly that's that's the way we're we're heading even more you know it's it's uh I am very hands-on with all of our projects. I, you know, there's not a project that comes through that I just phone in and don't listen to. I mean, I'm, I'm literally in the mix on everything. It's, I, I'm obviously, you know, playing a little bit of different role in each project depending on what the artist needs and what the project needs. But it's always a team thing, and to me, that's just kind of the only way I know how to do it now. Yeah. So obviously, keeping servanthood and team at the center of songwriting and producing what are some other values that you specifically like keep in the forefront of your mind while you're writing while you're co-writing or while you're working with an artist um, producing their album yeah well I always have to remind myself and you know it feels like I'm kind of saying the same thing again but we really are in a service industry as a songwriter I'm not out to write a song that I'm going to be out performing on stage every night I am in the room to help an artist or another writer or usually an artist develop the best way that they want to say their message. It's really not my message. I'm not going to be the one saying it from stage every night or singing it from stage every night because they're the ones who get the letters from fans and they're the ones who have fans come up to them after shows and it, it really has to come from a real place. That's not to say that every artist has to write 100% of their own songs because there's a lot of artists who don't write anything who are incredibly amazing artists. But the first thing I keep in my mind is that it's a service industry. If I say something that I think is amazing and the artist is like, eh, that's cool, but maybe not. You know what I'll do? I'll just literally make a note in my iPhone and say, that was a really cool idea. And then I'll try to use it later for something else. You know, that, that happens quite frequently that, you know, one of my ideas or even one of my songs gets passed on and then somebody else hears something in it that the other person did it, and then it becomes a big thing for them. So that's kind of the beauty of songwriting is just to kind of keep the focus on the artist. How can I serve them? Even if it's maybe not said in a way that I would say it, that's kind of the beauty of it. Yeah, okay. I guess that kind of leads me in a curious other direction. But when it comes to songwriting, is it more often than not that you have an idea that you, like you said, you don't use it right away, but you save it. Do you normally go back and finish that? Or do you have a lot of like halfway written songs or just barely developed ideas? Or do you almost always finish? That's another kind of core value is I, I'm, I'm really big on finishing things. So I honestly don't have a lot of kind of halfway ideas sitting around, but there are, you know, maybe some songs that are completed that are going to get reused for somebody else but then an artist may rework them and retweak them you know there's that's a pretty common thing that happens we'll, we'll finish writing a whole song and then we'll play it for an artist say hey would you want to jump in on this or would you want to you know cut this and you can tweak anything you want you know maybe maybe they like the chorus but they don't like the verses or vice versa so honestly we don't have a ton of little just pieces laying around um i do have notes uh you know i use the apple notes app i have quite a few just pages of song titles and song ideas and lyric ideas so i do have some of that and and some of the writers that i work with like every time mia fields comes in she's got like pages full of song titles and she's just got books full of it so usually there is something to go off of but i'm not freaked out if we literally don't have anything i mean because usually you can come in and have a conversation and figure out where the other person's heart is and then okay that's the song we're supposed to write today you know yeah that's interesting we um in my songwriting class last semester my professor james tealy he actually compared showing up to a co-write without some sort of idea as showing up to a party without cookies or some sort of present but i think also like you said it can be 
based on just a conversation you have with that person. So if you don't know your co-writer very well and it's like the first time you're writing, is it easier to just talk to them for a few minutes or 30 minutes, however long, and get something from that? Or is it easier to just show up, meet them, immediately start off of an idea you already have? I think James is totally right when he says, you know, show up with something. But they're they're literally, I mean, life happens and there are going to be some days you just don't have it. And I just, what I'm saying is don't beat yourself up for that. Because especially, like you said, when you're walking in the room for the first time, having never met an artist, I literally have no idea if my thing that I just came up with would be the best for them or if it would be the best for somebody else. Because I don't know where they're at. I don't know what they're listening to. I don't know lyrically how they like to work some people um even how people like to start a song is different like some guys literally will vibe on a track for a day or two at a time and before they even write anything lyrically or melodically there's other ones that like okay we got to finish this thing in uh two hours or three hours you know so you you really just kind of have to feel it out and match matching pace is is an important thing so i if I had my way, I would always have something. There's a lot of sessions I've had something prepared and then I had a conversation with them and it went a completely different way. And then that thing just got filed for the next time or something. So, um, I, I, I think, yeah, the, the more important thing is just to learn to be a good listener. And that's the, been the number one skill that I think, um, has, has served me really well is that I just, I, I, I understand the importance of listening before, throwing ideas out that makes sense when you're making something to be listened to that Mm -hmm. you have to be a good listener yourself absolutely that kind of leads into another question so when you're talking about vibing on a track for a couple days versus we have to finish this in two hours i've heard a couple speakers who've come to belmont and um one of them in particular said he loves working under pressure and he does his best work when he's given like a super short amount of time others don't like that at all and they don't want that boundary and they need to just have time to think. So which way do you personally like to work for yourself? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I love working under pressure. Uh, I, I think it's, I think deadlines are a great thing. Um, but I have also gotten great results the other way too. Yeah. I think the big thing is just to be able to roll with the punches Mm -hmm. and just know that every day is going to be different. Uh, Having a career in the music business is not like having a corporate nine to five where you know what to expect when you show up every day. Mm -hmm. It's about complete opposite of that. If what you want is a hundred percent structure and you want control of a situation, the music industry and especially songwriting is probably not for you. Um, But if you're like me and you like kind of the spontaneity of it and just rolling with it, then it's great. And I've gotten great results literally when an artist is only home for three hours and they need to spend time with their family. So we have an hour to write the song. I've gotten great results that way too. It's, it's, it's really not a what's better, what's worse. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think um, certain artists have different workflows where it's more about the craft and just chipping away at something until it's right. Other ones have a workflow of let's write 80 or a hundred songs. Then we'll just pick the best, 13 or Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. So in my current songwriting class, we've got Drew Ramsey and he's pretty great. He was talking to us about... Yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, He was talking to us about TV Sync and I don't know if you've written a lot for TV Sync, but he showed us an instance where he got an email at noon and they wanted the song in the fully produced demo and the instrumental track all done by 6 p.m. So have you had a lot of that type of situation, even if it's not for sync? Honestly, not that tight of a time frame, but I I always joke with people that a lot of the stuff we do, I consider extremely last minute. Like we did a, uh, a single recently for uh, an artist named Michael W. Smith and he called and he's like, Hey, I'm I'm doing this thing called the passion and they're giving me a song on the soundtrack and it it needs done in 10 days. Can you do it? (laughs) So we do, we do encounter a lot of that, but I don't know that, you know, six hours or anything. We haven't specifically in my, in our, in our company done a lot of straight up stuff where we're like pitching for film and TV and sync. Anything that we've ever gotten that's been a sync placement has been a record song that just happened to work for a purpose yeah. or something. Um, we're starting to do more of that on every single record that we 
work on is encouraging artists to take, you know, if you've got a whole record, why not use two or three of the songs mm -hmm. specifically targeted towards a film TV sync thing. So we're doing a lot more of that now. Um, and, and really you kind of just, it's just a matter, matter of an in intentionality because it's a completely different type of song. Mm -hmm. But I have, you know, talking to Tim Lauer, he, he, do, he works that way all the time where he's, he's doing film TV stuff and they need it in five hours. And I, I just think it's, it's a world we haven't really explored a lot, yeah. but we definitely are used to the tight turnarounds, tight time frames. And that's another thing in, in, in music that, that I'll just say is that it's, it is really important to be good. It's really important to be a servant. But part of being a servant sometimes is being really fast mm -hmm. because people have a tight deadline and, you know, things happen and, you know, you, a lot of things are just outside of your control. So I think speed is a really important thing. Yeah. Tim is actually the one who I was referring to earlier who talked about working under pressure. Yeah. I found that really interesting, hoping that that is how I will work well. We'll see as that comes up. Sure. <laughs> so... You already kind of reference sync being like a particular niche that you write toward. Yeah. And yours seems to be Christian radio. And so do you ever go into a write thinking, okay, we're writing this single for radio, so it needs to, admit, to meet all these criteria? Or is it just you naturally tend towards radio sounding songs? Or is it something you have to develop over time? I think it's something you develop over time. But any song that I have felt like we have handcrafted to be an AC Christian radio song are never the ones that work. It's always the ones that we're just not thinking about radio at all. It's, That's it's it, we're not thinking about the gatekeepers. We're not thinking about, you know, is some imaginary demographic going to enjoy this? We're not, we're not overanalyzing it. Mm -hmm. You know, all the songs that, that I have been a part of that have ever worked are the ones that I just think don't necessarily fit in a format. And, the ones that we have tried just are the ones that don't work. So I tend to just throw it out the window as much as I possibly can. And just, it's really about writing a great song. If it happens to be a single, that's great. But I don't love, I don't know. I just feel like it takes a lot of the joy out of the process. If you're constantly thinking about, okay, well, are they going to really like this? Are they going to play this? Is this going to work on that format? Because at the end of the day, you really don't even know. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the things that work, uh, both in Christian, country, pop, it's it's any genre. A lot of the things that have worked in the last few years have been the things that shouldn't have worked on yeah. paper. And to me, it's just all music. I, I never want to be known as just, you know, they're the, the CCM radio production team. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done, we've done a lot of that and we've had great success at it, but we're also finding some success in the country market now and we're finding some success in the rock market with, yeah. with Skillet and um, just a lot of different, a lot of different places. And that, and that's kind of where I'd love to sit. I, I look up to Rick Rubin a lot in the sense that he's produced so many different genres mm -hmm. and he kind of transcends genre. He's just about great songs and great performances. That's something I definitely look up to in your songwriting as well as what I aspire to do myself. So when you talk about transcending genres, I feel like that isn't something that you just think about. It's just something that you naturally do when you write and you just are kind of everywhere. So that being said, with this whole concept of Christian music, I know we talked a little about this earlier, but if we could if we could talk about, you know, your take on what Christian music is or if it isn't really a thing or you just said all music is music, can you kind of take can you kind of explain your take on that and maybe how your faith influences working in genres that aren't, you know, Christian in quotes. Well, I think people connect ultimately with authenticity and they connect with honesty. And if you're being truly authentic and honest, you're going to write things that are the outpouring of your heart and mm -hmm. things that you have experienced, things that you live, things that you believe. I don't, you know, I guess there's there's probably a hundred examples to argue otherwise, but I, I think the songs that usually work and usually connect are the ones that come from an authentic place. And for me, being a believer, I think there's going to be an element in every single song that I'm ever attached to that, you know, has has that in it and has that message in it. So um, I think the same could be said of anybody. I think 
uh, I had a chance to U2 in concert in Nashville a few years ago on their 360 tour and was probably one of the more quote unquote spiritual, you know, live music experiences I've ever been a part of. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily quote unquote a Christian band, you know, there's just something about music that God created that has an innate spiritual thing that transcends even language and it transcends cultures. Mm -hmm. And so to box it into a format and just call it Christian music or even country or whatever it is, I I don't love doing that. It's again, it's, it's just, it's all music. It's all, it's all good. It can all have power and it can all transcend everything. That's why I love Europe. Um, When I used to tour in a band, I, I found that whenever we'd go over to like Germany or Sweden, um, or even Australia, they just love good music. They love pop music, but the same fan that loves like super heavy metal also loves Taylor Swift. Yeah, it's just they don't really care. I feel like in the states, it's maybe like, oh, I'm an indie kid, or I'm a hip hop kid, or I'm I'm into like rock, so I don't love pop. Like, and and that could just be my perce- misperception, but that's where I tend to gravitate and that's kind of where my thought process is. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So when you're writing, I know that you do mostly co-writing now. Do you still write a lot of solo songs? And this kind of ties into, I guess, writing from personal experience because that's what people relate to is that honesty. So I guess my real question is when you're co-writing and you have like a really personal, maybe a hurtful story that, you want to share hope through because you got through that hurtful situation. Is it really difficult for you to share that with your co-writer or is it just something you've gotten used to being vulnerable with? Well, that's a great question. And I will say it's been a long time since I've written a song 100% myself and just never, you know, let it, let it out of my system. I always show them to somebody or give them to somebody because otherwise it's just for me. But there are a couple songs, and every now and then I'll get one that I know. This one is really just kind of meant for me, and it's maybe meant for me to share with my wife. And if nobody else ever hears it, that is completely fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a couple like that that are really special to us. And, you know, Salise even talked to me about, you know, well, are you going to, you should have somebody do that. But then my fear is, you know, I think the song is what it is. It's one of those things where if I ever, pitched a song to somebody i'm always so open-handed with it to say do your thing with it Mm -hmm. but there are those very few moments that i've written something that i feel like is it just is exactly what it needs to be Mm -hmm. so i'm almost of the mentality of let's just keep it for us and it doesn't have to ever make us any money it doesn't have to ever land on a record Mm -hmm. it's just our it's just our song you know so there are those every now and then but that is very few and far between. Normally every idea that I come up with, I write down and, you know, share it with someone, share it, share yeah. it in the room. Cause otherwise it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing music just for the sake of music. I'm, I'm doing it for a, a higher purpose. You know, it, if it was just for me, then I'd probably have a hard time getting to where I've gotten, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I mean, I really believe that's why we have the Psalms. And just like you were saying, you can't really box music into genre completely, especially when it comes to labeling it Christian or not, because David wrote things like crying out from the depths of Sheol. Yeah. That's not a very happy thought. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, it's honest and relatable. So I think there's a place for that. And it still gives hope because you, in listening to that, know that somebody else is going through that or went through it and made it. Yeah. And you can take hope in that because, or at least someone who may be not a Christian will look at that and go, well, how did they make it through? And I think that opens the door in itself to talking about your faith, even more so than, you know, not more so, I guess, but sometimes than a worship song because not everyone listens to worship music. And right. I love worship music and I'm a Christian. Someone who's not a Christian may not like it, Yeah, you know? So if they hear like maybe a sad song, but they see that person, you know, they go to their social media or something and they're still, you know, active and still making music. They didn't just like drop off the face of the planet after they wrote that one sad song. Right. Obviously they got through it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So I really appreciate that, um, about the Psalms and about your songwriting is that you're just so, you know, 
stick to the truth and what's actually happening yeah. in your yeah. life. So, well, and to go back to the conversation of, you know, Christian versus non-Christian, I mean, are you going to go to a doctor because it says he's a Christian doctor? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. No. Are you going to go <laughs> to a mechanic because it says he's a Christian mechanic? I don't think so. I think if a doctor was to say, I'm only seeing Christian patients, it would be a little bit weird and kind of anti what the Bible says. So exactly. It's, it's, there's, there's that element of it too, but music just kind of has so much power that it can hit somebody in it's it's all about seasons like you said where david's got those psalms that are completely mountaintop and then completely bottom of the valley Mm -hmm. and it's not going to hit everybody the same way at the same time and i'm even going to be kind of controversial because i know this is this is fresh top of mind but the, the artist Prince actually just just died as yeah. of the time that we're recording this episode. Mm-hmm. And I'll even go out on a limb and say, you know what, I was never even that big of a Prince fan. But I just had lunch with a couple friends of mine who, they were like, what, you're not a Prince fan? Like, he's the best, like, Purple Rain, it's just changed my life. And I grew up in kind of a strict home, and I wasn't, number one, allowed to listen to secular music, but... I went back and listened to like Michael Jackson and Madonna and I'm like, wow, that stuff is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I just never had that same connect for whatever reason with Prince. And that's the power of music because a lot of other people obviously did have that Mm -hmm. because he could go sell out, you know, 17 shows at Madison Square Garden or whatever he did. Yeah, I think that shows that it's more than just musical style. It's just that you connect to that person's story and sometimes you don't, sometimes you do. An example, I don't remember where I got this from, but I really love it, is that Jesus, as a carpenter, didn't make a table and write Christian table on it. He just made a table and blessed somebody with the table. So I feel like it's the same with music, is that we use it to bless people, and by labeling it as anything, you automatically box it to just that crowd. Sure. When it could be used to reach a much larger crowd. So it makes a lot of sense. When you are working with co-writers and let's say you go to write with someone who's obviously not a Christian, maybe they don't know, or um, even opposed to Christianity, I'm not sure if you've had that experience or not. I'm sure you have, but how do you approach that? And do you have like hills to get over there in the songwriting process where maybe you don't want to write about a certain subject or you have certain standards where you won't cross certain lines? How does that kind of play out? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to authentic authenticity and honesty i mean i I think you know i'm probably not gonna have the next uh pop smash booty shaking hit (laughs) i just i'm not gonna have that i'm not gonna be a part of that song because i you know that's just i have a daughter now and i have my i have beliefs and um i've been a part of those sessions every now and then with um like there, there are certain artists that I write with who they know exactly what they want to say. Their faith is very important, but they're maybe not a Christian, quote unquote, artist. There are things that they won't say that you know maybe another writer in the room will throw out. Would you say this? Would you say that? Is that too edgy? Like, so I think it is important to know your your kind of quote unquote boundaries. I mm-hmm. I don't think I'm legalistic by any stretch. I mean, a lot of people take issue with things like smoking and drinking and cussing or whatever. And this isn't even really a discussion about that. It's more a discussion of being true to who you are. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that everything that I'm ever attached to really is true to who I am and what I believe. Yeah. I think that carries through your music more than, you know, being legalistic or not. It just needs to be between you and God and you and scripture, really what you have peace in your spirit about. Absolutely. When you're writing and whether or not good is going to come of that. so Absolutely. So this is more of like a personal curious question. You've talked a lot about not going to college on some of your previous podcasts. And so obviously it's different like someone like me who didn't have the opportunity to learn before college. It was helpful for me. But how did that play out for you when you went straight from high school into the music industry and what kind of helped you make that decision? Yeah, well... Here's what I'll say on that. I I definitely am never one to say, hey, college is the wrong thing for you. If you want to work in the music business, don't go to college. Mm-hmm. That's for sure not what I'm saying. But 
I, what I will say is a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go to actually to Belmont and um, participate in the internship fair. And we met yeah, a lot. I of, sent a few of my friends over there. So yeah, hopefully they said hi. <laughs> totally. And they're awesome. A lot of really talented, talented people there. And um, yeah, it's just insane. The, the, the level of talent and drive that kind of comes out of there. But then you also kind of meet those other kids that are, you know, coming up and I'm like, so, Hey, so what do you want to do? That's the first question. Like, how can we, how can we help you? Why are you, why are you here? Why are you coming up to our, our table in the first place? And a lot of them are like, I, I don't know. You know, I just, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm going to music business, going to get, have a music business degree. So I thought I'd come up here and then we're like, well, what, what are you going to, you know, what do you, what's your end game? What's, what do you want to do with music business degree? And it's surprising to me. It's always like astonishing to me, the level of people are just like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, that's a pretty big thing to be throwing thirty thousand dollars a year out or the window more, at, yeah. or more. Honestly, that was a huge thing with in my family. My parents wouldn't have ever, you know, wanted me to go to college. Period. No matter what field of study it was, if I didn't at least have an idea of what my gifts are and what I enjoy doing and what I want to focus my time on, because if you don't have a sense of that then how do you know when you get into quote unquote the real world, you know, that degree isn't going to do you any good yeah. unless you have a motivation towards a specific yeah. thing. And I know that's, you know, part of what college is about. And even my own goals have kind of shifted in the last year as I've learned more about different areas of the industry. But I think you have to go into college looking for that and not just aimlessly wandering around hoping something's going to jump out at you. I mean, it's a search process, honestly. Yeah. Rarely does a good idea just find you out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to go after it. Yeah. And my thing that I will say is, again, I'm, I'm not against colleges. I'm not against traditional education. But I do think for a lot of people going into university or college or whatever they're going into with the idea that I'm doing this to help find who I am and help figure out what I want to do. I just don't buy that idea. Mm -hmm. I don't buy the idea that you have to pay $120,000 yeah. and spend four years of your life to somebody else to find out who you are and find out what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot easier and she, well, not easier. Easier is not the right word. It's not easy. More efficient. There are, maybe. There are a lot efficient and more, uh, just better ways of, of doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I will say. And, and that's always my challenge to people is just, if you know why you're doing something and you can and you you feel like you're a hundred percent on board with it, keep doing it. But if you don't know why you're doing it and you're just doing it because that's what everyone else does or that's what somebody told you you're supposed to do, you know, that's when you're in trouble. Yeah. So this is kind of a tough question. I'm not in this situation myself, but what if you've got someone college age, their parents are of the mindset that you need to go to college no matter what. Um, and they really still don't know exactly what they want to do, but they don't want to waste, you know, all that time and money in school studying something they may not even end up having a career in. What are some steps that that person could take to kind of figure out first what their gifts are and what God has given them to be good at and then also what they enjoy? I mean, what, it, what do they do to jump into something and figure out, hey, this is what I want to do with my life or at least the general direction? I mean, I think it's just a lot of honestly just trying a lot of different things. I mean, go serve, go do internships. I mean, you don't have to have a – this is something a lot of people don't really realize, but when we're looking for interns, it doesn't have to just be somebody that's going to a university. Mm -hmm. Like, you can literally call up anybody and say, hey, can I intern with you or can I serve or can I apprentice under you? That's a great place to start. If, if you think you might be interested in sports broadcasting, go – call ESPN and say, Hey, do you need any interns right now? I will go, you know, run your, your dry cleaning to, to and p take you, take you to the chiropractor, do whatever you want. Uh, just so I can kind of be around it and soak it up. So yeah. that's number one is being proactive. I do get it coming from personal experience. I come from a family that's pretty traditional and, you know, both my parents went to college, have the degree. And that's kind of just what you did. And I, I was actually enrolled to go to college in Nashville at Trevecca for music mm -hmm. business. And it was, it was kind of a uh, rock in the boat moment when I decided not to do it. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so what I'll say is you, you really at some point in your life have to 
have to realize that you you really are in control of it and you your parents, your family, your friends are are not. You, you have to find out what your passions are, what your callings are, what your giftings are, and nobody else can tell you what those are. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's a God thing, it's a you thing. And that's what I'll say. You, you know, you just have to at some point be willing to go out on a limb, cut the cord for lack of a better term. Yeah. You know, even if you, you're going to you're going to probably face some opposition whether it's from your parents or from your friends or from people, but that's part of life. It's just being able to deal with the naysayers and and still stick into your convictions. Mhm. It's interesting, you know, finding that opposition. This is kind of just a general thing towards songwriting specifically. I've heard not personally directed at me, but at songwriting in general or through hearsay, the question is asked, what are songwriters actually do? And I find that question really kind of funny. And I think it's humbling because it forces you to answer, obviously, like, well, what do we do? And why, more so, why do you do it? So, you know, if you're going into the music industry wanting to songwrite, this is a cool example. One of my professors, um, he actually answered someone with this But he said to think of songwriters as emotional chemists going into the Mm. studio and mixing different things to figure out how to basically mend hearts instead of mending brains like a surgeon might do. So have you ever come across someone who it kind of made it difficult for you to step back and answer that? Like even if it was not in a condescending way, if I were to ask you what does a songwriter actually do, how would you answer that? It's actually a, a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to borrow from an earlier guest on our show and say that, you know, we're giving people prayers to pray and words to say when they don't have words. We're taking things that are very complicated, taking questions that are really, to some degree, unanswerable and trying to make some sense of them and put them into a simple enough form to where people can sing them and understand them. And, you know, I always go back to the saying of when I can't speak or when I can't pray, I sing. When words fail, music speaks. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's so much the job of songwriters is to take the complicated and make it simple. And and a lot of that is taking this part of your brain that that not very many people are good at accessing. It's 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 the deep part of the brain that is is the why part it's the emotional part it's the Mm -hmm. part that you try to access when you're doing therapy and things like that but it's basically taking that part of the brain and putting words to it and giving people you know to borrow jason ingram's analogy giving people life rafts sometimes Mm -hmm. you know sometimes people need a life raft sometimes People need an anthem to sing when they're really happy and just graduated from college or, Mm -hmm. you know, just got married or something. So we're essentially providing people new ways to express what they're already feeling. That's interesting. I mean, it connects to what you said earlier about music being extremely spiritual. And there's a scripture, and again, I know I should know this better, where it is where it talks about the Holy Spirit praying on our behalf when we don't have words to say. Mm. And that would make sense with music, with it being a spiritual thing. So I think the Holy Spirit really can move through music, you know, no matter what song it is, honestly. I mean, maybe not something that's about something vulgar, because I don't think good comes out of that. But talking about something maybe vulgar that you went through right? Um, and are coming out of, I think the Holy Spirit can talk through people's stories, you know, motivational speakers. That's kind of what I I don't want to just put words in your mouth, but I feel like that's what you do through music is you're like a motivational speaker yeah. musically. Totally. Totally. Yeah, it's it's giving people motivation. But even more than motivation, it's it's I guess it's inspiration because if you can on one level it's easier to motivate people to do something because if you're a boss at a company, one way to motivate people is to pay them. Mhm it's harder to inspire people because that's not about paying them to do something. It's about finding something that's already in their heart and making them do it because they believe in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what music is. It's, it's that universal language. Um, actually was just talking to a friend of mine that did just did a mission trip to Zimbabwe and he came back saying just how amazing it was. And they were essentially teaching songwriting, but 
they were down there singing one of the songs I had written with Jeremy Camp, and it, you know, it's obviously not their native language, but the fact that it kind of doesn't even matter, it just sort of mm -hmm. transcends that, and stylistically is nothing like what they're doing in Zimbabwe, but it's it's just something, again, to keep going back to that, saying that it transcends cultures. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, also, you know, talking about that, a lot of artists will talk about something that keeps them going is getting response from fans and getting a letter that, you know, tells them how one of their songs touched that person or kept them from doing something they should it or encouraging them to do something they should. As a songwriter who's more behind the scenes than the artist, do you often get to see some of that response for yourself? And does that affect you? And how does that, I mean, obviously it probably motivates you to keep doing what you're doing. Here's the hard part because I've been through phases where I'm like, well, I don't want to look at radio charts. I don't want to see how my songs are reacting. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see where they are on the iTunes chart. But I think if you're a professional songwriter and what your mission is, is to give people songs that connect with them, you have to know what songs are actually connecting. Yeah. So I've started being a lot more active with that. Just, you know, I have my publisher send me numbers every week. And um, I know that that's kind of a right brain, left brain thing. And some people don't like to even have that in their consciousness. But it's like, I mean, you, you can't really manage what you can't measure. Mm -hmm. So... I love seeing, you know, okay, well, this song I thought was going to be huge peaked out at number 30 or something. And it's not even that chart position and that radio play is everything, but it's, it's, it is it is an indicator that there's something in it that makes people want to play it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. whether that's the person's voice or the artist's story or the artist's personality or just the song is that awesome. I think when you encounter something like that, you got to say, okay, well, we should probably do more of that mm -hmm. because that's what people are connecting with. So you just mentioned um, the artist's voice touching people. And this kind of made me go into a more technical side of songwriting, but do you ever write melodically thinking about just that person's voice? Like who's singing it? How can we make their voice shine the brightest through the melody type thing? Because you know that that is what connects with people do you come across that often, or is it usually melody is more important than the voice? Well, I don't know if it's a thing that one's more important than the other. I, I think there are times that we're in a session and we're thinking, I mean, it's it's a little different because we're not very often in sessions where we're just writing songs to pitch to an outside artist. It's just mm -hmm. music industry and publishing and songwriting doesn't necessarily work like that. It, you know, occasionally still will, and probably in country music it's still like that more so than any other genre. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times when you're writing with the artist in the room, which is what we tend to do and what we like to do, you're going to know right away if the artist sounds good singing it yeah. because they're sitting right there and you're going to know if it's in their range. They're going to know if it feels good to sing. Um, those times that you are shooting for something outside though, and it does happen, you know, songs get pitched and songs get cut. It's, it's, it happens all the time. It's a, I think it is a good idea to be thinking about, okay, well, if I want Keith Urban to cut this song, I probably should get somebody to sing it that is in his kind of ballpark of his mm -hmm. vocal range and vocal styling. So I think that's smart. But again, I'll go back to this. A lot of the things that we had targeted towards one thing ended up being something that we didn't expect at all Yeah. vocally. So I think if it's a really great song and a great melody, it really doesn't matter. When you started... Extent. Yeah, when you started out, would you say you were writing more with artists or more towards pitching to outside artists? Like, what does that look like when you're first starting and nobody really knows your name? Yeah, sure. That's and that's part of the process. When you're a new writer uh, or a new producer or, or whatever, it's it's harder to get in those rooms, and you kind of really need somebody going to bat for you, whoever that is, whether it's your manager or your publisher or a friend of yours or a mentor. And, and thankfully I, I, I kind of had that with, you know, I, when I signed my first publishing deal as a songwriter, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had a guy that was a champion for me and honestly probably went to bat for me a lot more than I quote unquote deserved at the <laughs> time. So it is important to have a mentor or somebody in your life like that, who's plugging you in, in those, in those rooms. And, and, and you're, you're not going to start out at the top. I mean, you're going to, 
be working with things that are, you know, indie or in development or um, maybe not the A level artist, you're just not going to get invited into those rooms yeah. right off the bat usually. So, I think um, the the important thing isn't to to worry about what rooms you're getting in. It's just get in there and do it regardless. Mm -hmm. If you're not in a room with an A level artist, try to get in with a B level artist or if you can't get in with a B level artist, try to get in with a C or a D level artist. And if you're not even at that point, just get in a room with writers and start writing songs mm -hmm. because you're certainly not going to get any cuts if you don't write any songs. Yeah. So that being said about the publisher playing the role of mentor and kind of going to bat for you, what did that look like for you if you were looking for one or were they looking for you? I mean, how did that relationship look like and how do you go about as a new songwriter finding a publisher who will believe in you that much to go to bat for you and help kind of develop you into a stronger writer? I think if you're a new writer, I mean, this the same can be said of a new artist or a new anything, else, even outside of the music industry. If you're out there creating something that is compelling and you're building a story on your own, the right people are going to find you. You're not even going to have to look for them, okay. whatever that looks like. I mean... Yeah. I think that it's it YouTube is a is a perfect um illustration of that, you know. There's been a lot of people literally just start building a story on their own through doing YouTube cover songs and things like that. The same could be said of hey, you know, you're a new songwriter, you want to get a publishing deal, just go write 100 songs and, you know, start getting them around, start playing writers rounds. Just you have to put yourself out there for other people if you want somebody to find you so yeah but at some point you're going to hit a critical mass and you're going to start finding out what your strengths are finding out you know getting in your stride or whatever you want to call it and then when you hit that the right people are, are literally just going to find you it's mm -hmm. it's really not the other way around yeah okay i guess that's a really good way to think about it especially for someone like me who's just coming into this industry you know that's a big anxiety factor for me is finding the person to develop me but I guess it makes a lot more sense to just keep creating until that person finds you and you can't yeah. really force someone to believe in you they do or they don't it, it acts, absolutely yeah. yeah and the number one thing I hear from Belmont actually and it's very true is that you will get 50 no's to one yes yeah. so when you hit all that rejection in the beginning how what are some things that helped you to keep it from hurting you personally and helped you just keep going? Well, I think that's, that's a, a phenomenal question. I'm glad you asked that because that's something that I would love to communicate. If, you know, if that was kind of the message of this whole interview today is that if you can find your identity outside of what you do, then it will never matter if anybody says no to you. It's really, if you can find your identity and who you are as a person, and that takes a lot of personal development and, you know, really just knowing yourself. And that's a hard thing for artists and creatives because we pour our hearts and our souls into our craft and, and, and what we do. Mm -hmm. But if you can walk the balance of knowing that you are not what you do, I think that's when you win. So going into it, don't take it personally if somebody says, I don't like your song, you know, don't take it personally. If, if somebody says, this isn't for this artist, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with that. The song just literally might not be for them at that time. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing is just not finding your identity and what you do. That's really encouraging and helpful. You know, I think a lot of us, especially when you are in college, your whole identity is in what your major is and what you do. And it's not in what kind of person you are. And so, and it's very rare that you even find professors who want to develop you personally and help your character grow, but just watching you and other people I look up to, that is more important than the thing that they do. Yeah. And it kind of affects everything that they do, so. Totally. We had talked a little bit before about a couple of your philosophies that I found really interesting. No plan B and ready, fire, aim. And those are just really cool to me. So can you just kind of expound on like what those are to you and how they affect yeah. how you write, how you produce? Yeah. Well, no plan B is, is kind of what I talked about earlier. On, I can't remember what episode it was, but no plan B is basically if you have a plan B, you will 
fall back on it. Anytime we're talking to a new uh, producer or songwriter that wants to get in the industry, that's kind of uh, one of the first questions. Like, so do you have a fallback? What's your plan B if this thing doesn't work out? And usually if they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm taking business or accounting or something on the side, it's always what they're going to end up doing mm-hmm. because their their heart, there's a part of their heart that's not in it. There's a part of their heart that is a slave to fear, you know, because they're afraid that the artist thing's not going to work out or the creative thing's not going to work out. I think that's the same with, you know, to draw a parallel of a relationship. I mean, love is, is the biggest risk you can take of all, and you have to throw yourself completely into it and know that you might get your heart broken. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what no plan B is about. It's being all in, not having a fallback, and just saying, you know what, this is do or die. So, yeah. so that's that. And then I, I use a saying a lot called ready, fire, aim, that really kind of more so just sums up my life <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, my wife can probably attest <laughs> to this fact. But it's just jumping in. It's not, not getting something that we call analysis paralysis. Where you That's oh, a really cool phrase. I mean, that just perfectly sums up a lot of my thinking process right there. Analysis paralysis. <laughs> yeah, analysis paralysis. I, I love it. And I've just I've had so many friends that I I, I see get stuck in it. I mean it's mm-hmm. it's like um or I, I get stuck in it myself. You know, it's it's you you're overthinking the life out of something before it even is born. Yeah. So uh, you just never know. So a lot of the times you have to just jump in and know that, hey, the first few things you might fail at, but to that I'll say fail small, fail fast, and fail early mm-hmm. so it doesn't kill you. Yeah. It's like um, you know, real estate investing. If you're a real estate investor, fail small, fail fast, fail early. Don't go buy a giant farm and lose your entire life. You know, mm-hmm. Buy something small, figure it out, make some mistakes. Same thing with music. It's... Fail small, fail fast, fail early. I think that's really helpful for people like me, and I hope it encourages them when they listen to this that we have to try and, you know, put your whole heart into something that you love and don't second guess or overthink. You know, those are the top things that I hear my friends and myself talking about when we're stressed out. It's usually overthinking something or you know, like you said, slave to fear. Well, thank you so much. That's a great question though. And uh This has been a blast. We're going to do a lot more of this in the future. Uh, This has been Kaylee Ingram on our episode of Ask Me Anything. (laughs) And again, this is my daughter talking in the background. Again, email Kaylee, C-A-Y-L-E-A, at fullcirclemusic.org, and you will get a free copy of her 10 Things I Learned from Interning with a Grammy-winning production team. Yes, that will be in effect tonight so thank you so much for letting me kind of pick your brain and for the encouragement you give to me and everybody who's starting out so and for those of you guys who don't know kaylee is a phenomenal artist (laughs) would i'm putting you on the spot a third time (laughs) okay (laughs) can can we give away a free song to 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 people who who email kaylee at fullcirclemusic.org or are you not are you not there yet i mean you know they're not like an mp3 or a link to soundcloud or something yeah that would that would probably be the thing is the soundcloud um just got my soundcloud it's a baby soundcloud so the things that are on there are baby production obviously being in a dorm room you're kind of limited but this summer there will be some pretty cool hopefully cool things at least i think though where can they find your soundcloud at uh all of my Media online is C A Y L O D Y K L D. So if you do SoundCloud slash K L D, Facebook slash K L D, Instagram K L D, that's where kind of all my music lives right now. That's awesome. Go follow her on social media. Check what, <laughs> check out what she's doing. I think it's awesome. I'm a fan. This has been Kaylee <laughs> well, Ingram you. on Ask Me Anything on the Full Circle Music Show. Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, Full Circle Music Production. Once again, for Kaylee Ingram's top 10 things I learned from working with a Grammy-winning production team, email Kaylee, that's C-A-Y-L-E-A, at fullcirclemusic.org. The show was produced with editing help from Jericho Scroggins. Check us out online at fullcirclemusic.org. Follow us on socials. Our Instagram is fullcirclemusicco, that's fullcirclemusicco. Twitter is fullcirclemusic. Snapchat is fullcirclem. We'd love to see you on on our socials and uh, interact with you there. So 
We'll look forward to seeing you next week.